you're, you're trying to light up as many brains as much as possible. So how do I kind of make that a like simple thing for simple people like me to understand? I think about three things, words, structure. And- Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to the show. And this week we have another guest joining us. I can't wait. Bryce, who's in the hot seat? Oh, we're in for a treat this week, Marcus, because we have my good friend, longtime co-conspirator, Gavin McMahon, the co-founder and CEO of Fast Forward Consulting in New York. I have been working with Gavin for nigh upon a decade now. He is one of the, the best experts in communication and storytelling. Gavin, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's uh, nice to be here. And that's that's probably the best introduction I've had all year. Thank you. Well, we try. <laughs> we try. I like being called a co-conspirator. You like being called a co-conspirator? It's better than partner cool. in crime. That's my usual uh, nickname. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is awesome. So there is so much we could talk about, Gavin, because you are you are a true Renaissance man of of many interests and many uh, ideas. But I think that the thing that I would really like to focus on today is is leadership and storytelling. Well, it's funny. Uh, I think the modern name for a Renaissance man is scattered. That's a, that's another way to describe it. <laughs> a, 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 ADHD is is yeah, the modern uh, yeah, uh, parlance. Yeah, definitely something. Well, I was, think, I was thinking about this as we came on, and I always think about leadership as a choice. You make a choice. You go left, you go right, you go straight ahead, whatever the choice is. And the way I talk about storytelling, especially in the context of business, is that storytelling really amplifies that choice. And I think it's a great, you know, I think it's why we have such great conversations about red teaming and other things, because red teaming is right in the middle of that, because red teaming if I understand it well enough, and I, I, I think I do, but red teaming really just makes those choices better. It makes the, you shouldn't really go left in this case. You should actually probably go straight ahead on this one. It makes the right. choice better. Absolutely. It's all about making better decisions. So why, why do you twine the terms leadership and storytelling? Well, it's interesting. So... I'll tell you a story. I, so, I, Marcus, I know you're in the in the UK military, and I know there's probably a lot of people that were in the in the military. Um, I was a long time ago when I first graduated from university. I went to work for Vickers Shipbuilding, and I was working for the Armaments Design Group, working actually on AS nineties and things like that. And at the same time, I was. If you've ever been up to Barrow and Furness, and this no offense to anyone that lives in Barrow, back then in the <laughs> early nineties, it was it was the world's it was described as the world's biggest cul-de-sac. There was not a lot going on. So I joined the the Territorial Army, the kind of British equivalent, I guess, of the National Guard, Bryce, for I'm translating yes. into American for you. Um and spent a lot of time at, at Sandhurst and basically doing boys' own fun things at the weekend. Um but I remember at Sandhurst, <clears throat> you, you, they kind of teach you leadership through the idea that you're going to attack something and you're going to organize into this platoon and squad and you all play different roles. And I was lying on the ground somewhere, probably on Salisbury Plain, and there was a very large color sergeant that was shouting down at me. I was playing the role of a section commander, so normally in charge of seven people. And he said, what are you going to do now, sir? And I remember the whole kind of, the lessons on leadership and what you do is this big kind of manual, platoon manual, platoon commander's handbook, I think it was called. And it had all sorts of stuff in like, consider what the ground is like, the terrain, the disposition of the enemy, the the weather, your supply, all this like long list of stuff. And then you've got this very large color sergeant shouting at you. 
And I can remember going, I have no, no clue what to do. And I didn't, I didn't manage to fail. I probably came close. But <clears throat> when I actually was doing this kind of more or less for real and I, I was commissioned, I had a corporal in my platoon, Corporal Gray. And I remember this moment and I asked Corporal Gray, I said, what, what do you do in that situation when you have this choice of what to do? And you've got these people, uh, you know, and bullets are flying around or whatever it is that's going on. I mean, I was only ever a peacetime soldier, which is very good news for me. But I asked Corporal Gray and he said, well, uh, that's easy, sir. You only have three options. You can go left, you can go right, or you can go straight ahead. And I, and I went away from that conversation thinking, my God, I have an absolute genius in my platoon. This is like, <laughs> this man has boiled it down. All these complex commands coming on from high, some general brigadier, somebody with a strategy, and he's like got it nailed. And then I thought about it for a few days and I went back to him and I said, well, how do you choose between left, right, and straight ahead? Oh, he said, that's, that's really easy, sir. I just always go left. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, Corporal Gray was also a peacetime soldier, so nothing bad ever happened. But, but to me, Good job. that story, that story just demonstrates kind of what happens in business. You've got the general, the CEO in charge saying, I've got this strategy, I've got this laid out, uh, this is how it's all going to go. And then you trickle down. And, and basically, by the time everything trickles down and you get to the front line and whoever it is that's doing what with their team, they just always go left because it's too complicated. We haven't mm -hmm. kind of got people in the picture. So that, that to me is the, the clearest uh, connection, I think, between leadership and storytelling because it's all right making the choice, but at some point you have to get people to do these things. So how, do you, how does telling stories help people to do that? Well, I think stories, is, well, we, we should go back to your book, which at some point, which is how we first met. One of the best, I would say the second best quote I've ever heard about storytelling is from a, an American writer called Jonathan Gottschall. And he, he writes something like, a story is a trick for sneaking information into the fortified citadel of the human mind. Mm -hmm. which I think huh. is, is absolutely true. I love that. True. Wow. Psyche penetration. Yeah, and we have all the, we, our minds are fortified citizens that we really don't want to know. So, so if you can understand the trick, if you can use the trick and, and say, how do, I, how do I get this piece of information, this thing I want you to do, this direction I want you to go in, whatever it is, into that fortified citadel at some kind of scale, that's a pretty useful thing if I can figure out how to do that. And that, that's where I think storytelling really comes in. It's so, it's so critical because I think I, you, you, you said, you mentioned my book, and I think you mean my first book, American Icon. Mm -hmm. and, Al, and, and, and Alan Mulally was such an amazing storyteller. Mm. And, and I think one of the things that demonstrates that is when he, when he came to Ford as having been president of Boeing and took over Ford, and his Ford was careening towards bankruptcy. You know, all the lights were flashing red. Everything was dire. His first task that he set for himself or one of his first tasks was figuring out Ford's why. And he, you know, I described in the book how every day he'd have the archives uh, division bring him a box of, of stuff. And he said, I don't care what it is. I just want to see stuff from when Henry Ford was running this company. And, and, and they bring a box, it'd be press releases, it would be meeting notes, it would be advertisements, it would be brochures, it'd be all the stuff from the teens and 20s of, of, the, of the 20th century when Henry Ford was running the company. And he found this iconic ad that Henry Ford had taken out in the Saturday Evening Post in, in 1924, I believe, you know, of, of this, this Model A with this young couple looking over what I, I guess was a, uh, a beautiful vista in the 1920s of, yeah. a, of a landscape with a bumper to bumper car cars on all the highways and smoking factories in the distance. Yeah. And, and, the, and what captured him was not so much that image, but the headline, which was opening the highways for all mankind. 
And people were were a bit dismayed. And he he had copies of this made, given to all the executives. He, he blew it up, put it on the wall of the, their meeting room and all this stuff. And, and he shared it with everybody. And the reason why, when people said, like, uh, you know, shouldn't we be working on our action plan and stuff? And he's like, yes. But he said, you know, before we can fix this company, we have to know why we're even showing up for work every day. We, we need to have a destination that we're going. And that's storytelling in action, right? Yeah. Absolutely. It's, you know, people need to see themselves in the picture. Marcus, I don't know if Bryce has told you this, but how we know each other, my partner, Rose, my business partner, Rose, gave me Rose. Marcus has met Rose. Yeah. She's been on the show. Rose So she gave gave me Bryce's book and said, you've got to read this book. You've got to read this book. And I always have a pile of books that I'm waiting to read. So I got to the bottom (laughs) of the pile. Eventually, I read eventually I read it and then I kind of I read this but and it's like it, it I mean for a business book it's there are very few page turners and it, for me it was a complete page turner yeah. so I read it and then I emailed I, I completely fanboyed Bryce because I I've never done this ever <laughs> before or since maybe I've done it once since well, yeah. but I I basically somehow sculpted out his email address and and said you don't know me from Adam I've just read your book. I think it's fantastic. Blah, blah, blah. I can't remember what else I said, but fanboy, fanboy, fanboy. And, and then he, he, he was in a good mood that day because he thought, well, I'm actually going to speak to this weirdo. And, <laughs> and that's how we know each other. It was your accent that he liked. As soon as he yeah. you were British, he thought, I love it. It came through on the email. It does. Always does. Yeah. No, I think it's brilliant. And going back to the story you told about the corporal and, and this storytelling really helps, A, as Alan mentioned, you cascade that why, but also it relates to what we talk about, mission command, this delegating decision-making responsibility. If you're trying to do that, you know, most leaders are struggling to do that. Those that are doing that, yeah. if you don't cascade that in the right way and provide that clarity, then the front line is always going to go left because, as you said, that, that yeah. strategy, that documented planning, it's too convoluted. It's too confusing. And, and as that cascades down, it invariably gets added to rather than clearer. So if you can turn that into a story which flows down through to the front line and it's understood and it's, you know, captured by people, as they, you know, captivating yeah. as they go through and hear this, then they'll have the opportunity to go left, right, or straight ahead. And they'll know which is the yeah. right one to do because they get the story. They're part of the story. And this goes back to that, A, what's your why? What's your purpose? And are we clear where we're all going and how we need to get there? And if the road changes, if there's a blockage, if there's a tree coming down in the left side, are we able to continue and pivot or do we go into paralysis? Yeah. And I think, no, I think en- enabling probably- leaders to do that storytelling is phenomenal. Yeah, I think that's right because if you, if you- – I mean, the, the, the old way, the command and control where you cascade down leads to this either I'm just going to ignore that or it's so rigid there's no autonomy. And I think, <clears throat> I think that's what most leaders struggle with is this idea that I, I need to drive alignment down through the organization, but I need to give you enough uh, room to, to do whatever it is you need to do, because you know better, you have more information on the ground, you know what's going on, you can actually make better decisions. I just want the decision to roughly line up in this direction. And if you can, if you can get, if you can hit that sweet spot of both, it's awesome. And I think that's what, I mean, going back to, this is the last fanboy comment I'll make about Bryce's book, but that's what that book was all about. When you think about American Icon, it was really a story of how Alan Mulally had pretty, I would say, I'm not going to use the word rigid, but pretty focused kind of command and control ways of getting his message down. But he left room in there Mm -hmm. for people to to make better decisions because he, you know, there's no CEO, every decision for everyone. Do you know what he did? And I've been listening and learning and absorbing this story from the sidelines and I've met Alan and listened to Bryce many yeah. times. Do you know what Alan did? He made people part of the story. Yeah. Right. He, he allowed did. people and to he join them him into the story with them. in that story so they felt they were part of something much bigger than what they were doing themselves. And they saw that, they felt that his leadership 
cascaded that rather than that direct intent. He made them part of something, which I think is such a powerful thing that you can do as a leader. Yeah, and, and Marcus, you're so right, and and he did it in 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 a literal way. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've talked this, about this on on the show before. When I when I in those days when I was a journalist covering Ford Motor Company, how at press conferences, Alan would physically grab the shoulder of an engineer or a designer or another executive and pull them physically in front of the cameras with him, put his arm around them and say, this is Steve. Steve is the guy who led the team that's responsible for us getting 14% more fuel efficiency out of the next generation F-150. Yeah. Steve is the guy, who, Steve and his team did this and they're, you know, and, and literally making them part of the story. Yeah. And that was such a sharp contrast mm-hmm. to how Ford had been run in the past, you know, where you had CEOs like Jack Nasser who literally would be pushing people off the stage Right, you know, to to stand in the spotlight by themselves, and and you know the joke with, with Nasser was that there was no announcement that was too small for Jack Nasser. I mean, if Ford came up with a three percent brighter headlight, Jack would call a press conference and stand on the stage and bask in the glow of the TV cameras and stuff, and talk about how he was bringing light to the world and stuff. And yeah. you know, I mean, so I mean, it, it's but but Marcus is ap- you're absolutely right it it's it's bringing people into the story but it's yeah. also it's not just in a feel good way it's in it's also mm-hmm. in a real way because he wanted to hear what people had to say yeah. he wanted to bring out the good ideas that existed in people down lower in the organization and let them be part of the solution and you know it's different you know, about a story versus sorry Gary no go ahead i was just going to say uh, and what's different about a story to a plan Plans are normally fixed, aren't they? They're a, here's yeah. what we're doing for the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months. A story evolves. And if you brought yeah. the people in and you're allowing them to contribute, then where that's, you know, you know the direction it's going in, but you don't know what avenues it's going to go down. You don't know the ending. You're hoping it's going to be a good one, but you're allowing yeah. people to craft, craft that future trajectory rather than here's the plan, carry on, decisions fixed. Command, yeah. command, yeah. command. Exactly. I, I think there's a whole shift, and I, I, I think there's a lot of leaders haven't really um, got with it or really understand the program. You, you don't, you don't, you really don't have as much control as you think you have. You have influence, and how are you going to influence? I'll, I'll tell you something. We're doing is we we work with a lot of organizations that are kind of driving transformation. It could be cultural transformation. It could be digital transformation. What is it they're doing? And we and we obviously operate. The two levers that we operate are, are leadership and storytelling. So, for example, huge organization, it has this, this kind of change agenda. This is what we're going to do. This is the vision. This is the mission, all of that. And, and you get some really good messaging that, that does that very much like, you know, Alan did with what he went back to with, uh, you know, creating the world, the road ahead for, for all mankind or whatever the line was. But you do that. To, to your point about how do you get people in the picture, one of the things that we've, we do when we work with clients will help them with this, this kind of basic messaging about how do they get out and how do they tell it in story format. But I think it's really important to think about the idea of fan fiction. So what do I mean by that? If you think about a movie that opens – on the opening, I think the creator's opening this weekend, right? So the the opening weekend, the box office of the opening weekend is really driven by what does the marketing department do? How good are the trailers? How good is the kind of buzz that they build? But it's really formal marketing, formal messaging that builds that. The second weekend and the third weekend are all driven by word of mouth, how people yeah. talk about it. So one of the things that we've done, or we will typically do, is you get this formal messaging, and then we'll encourage people to create fan fiction. So we've literally had uh, kind of events or moments in, the, in change programs where we give them the, the, the bones of what the message is and said, okay, off you go, write your own fan fiction. And we've had... We've had people come back with poetry. We've had people come back with, you know, their 
their C-level executives superimposed on Willy Wonka videos in a TikTok format. <clears throat> We've had, you know, skits, all sorts of things. But what that really does is that people, at, even though every single form is different and very creative and very funny, I mean, it's not Saturday Night Live funny, but it's it's funny for the people in the know. <laughs> You, you get, but they really own it and they really get, you see, you see that they, oh yeah, you've got all the key essence of the messages and you, you know what your options are. You know, you could go left, right or straight ahead and, but people feel a freedom in that. And so I think that's the beauty of storytelling. And we've got to, I think when people think about messaging, they, they get a little bit too precious about, well, we don't. We don't use that word or it's definitely got to, that's the wrong shade of blue that you're using. If you do that, you just throttle all the fan, the fan mm-hmm. fiction, which is what you really want. You want people to see themselves in the picture. I love that. I love that. That's so powerful. And, you know, it's seeing yourself in the picture is, is so important on a lot of different levels. It's important in terms of engagement. And we talk a lot about how abysmal employee engagement is these days yeah. and how the reason why is because people the don't The lowest see in nine picture. years. It's important. The, and, and the other reason that it's important is because seeing yourself in the picture means you understand what needs to be done, where you fit. And, you know, this, again, I'll go back to Alan, his famous four-point program to save Ford Motor Company. Yeah. Build cars and trucks that people want and value. Restructure the company to operate profitably at the changing demand and model mix. Work together effectively as one team and finance the plan. Boom. Dead simple. And, and when people were, were, would say to him, you know, there's got to be more to it than this. His answer was no, there doesn't have to be more to it than this. Because if, if, if it's just these four things, then everyone from the C-suite to the factory floor can understand the plan. And more than that, they can see where they fit into the plan and mm-hmm. where they can put their shoulder to the flywheel yeah. and get it moving forward. And if you come up, you know, this goes back to you lying in the, the mud on, on Salisbury Plain. <laughs> if you come up with this elaborate arcane plan for world domination that mm-hmm. so many of these, these CEOs have today, nobody sees themselves in that. And so they just go left. Yeah. But if you give somebody something that clear, then, then, then even Corporal Gray can uh, can say, right, based on those four points, I know I should go right today. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what it's all about. Can you, Bryce, I know you've probably told it on this podcast before, but can you tell the Alan Mulally going to Wall Street story? You know, the it's my favorite story <laughs> yeah, that yeah. you tell. Can you just... Yeah, absolutely. Marcus is sick of hearing it, but I don't mind. <laughs> um yeah, so so Alan was hired as CEO in September of, of, of 2006. He he articulated the, the four-point program by December of 2006, was approved by the board. He printed it out on cards, gave them to every employee in the world, started using these four points everywhere. And in spring of 2007, so about three, four months later, the New York Auto Show happens. And the New York Auto Show, because it's in New York, is an opportunity for Wall Street to really engage with the auto industry. So every year they pick one CEO and they do they all the analysts, everyone on Wall Street who follows the auto industry for all the big banks, all the investment houses comes and, and, and listens to that CEO outline their plan and their vision and their strategy and pepper them with questions. And so I, I went to that event and, and because this Alan was the new CEO of Ford, he was the CEO that year who was picked to, to, to be the lead in that. And afterwards, a couple of weeks later, I was, I, I had a previously scheduled interview with him one-on-one in his office in, in back in Dearborn, Michigan. We'd started to click by then we'd started, I wouldn't say we were friends yet, but we were, we were, we were on the verge of, of becoming friends. And, uh, he said, uh, did you attend the, the, the wall street event? And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, what, did, what did folks think of my presentation? And I said, well, <laughs> do you want, do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to, 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 to tell you a, a happy story? And he said, no, of course I, I wouldn't ask you the question if I didn't want to know the truth. And I said, well, they hated it. And he said, well, I don't understand why, why did they hate it? 
I said, Alan, you, you've been saying the same thing since last year. I wake up and I don't even work for Ford Motor Company. I wake up at night in a cold sweat saying, restructure the company to operate profitably at the changing demand and model mix. And, and my wife thinks I'm crazy. I've heard this four points so many times now. It literally is bouncing around inside my head. I don't even work for your company. The guys on Wall Street are the same way. And, 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 you know, one of the, one of the senior analysts told me, he says, this guy seems like he's a pre, he, you know, he's running for president. And this is his stump speech where he's going out and giving the same speech everywhere. And he looked at me like I had just said something really ridiculous. And he said, well, well what do they want from me? And, and I said, well, they want to hear something new. They want to hear a new plan, a new, a new vision. And he, he said, but we haven't done these four things yet. So why would there be a new plan? Why would there be a new vision? And it, you know, it's, it was like a, a face palm moment to me. Cause I was like, duh, because I, you know, the reason that was so, so shocking to me was because every other CEO in the auto industry at those days, particularly in Detroit was every six months coming out with a new vision. And they never yeah. did any of the things that they, that they talked about, but they got a lot of press. They got a lot of attention. They got people jumping up and down with pom poms and stuff. And they used to give out those little uh, silicone bracelets with their, you know, like way forward and stuff like this on them. And it didn't mean anything. It was all just a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. But it, it, it was it it fed the beast and and it was the new thing. And Wall Street could write, you know. And so here comes this guy with this radical concept, which is that we're actually going to do what we say we're going to do. And we're not going to change what we do until we do those things. I love that. I love that story because it makes it so simple. And it, and I think oftentimes we forget how simple it really is. I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of almost opposite story. Different CEO. Yeah. It's a bad story, so I can't name any names. Um, but <laughs> So this is a CEO comes in, fairly big company, listed company. And he has this new vision for kind of taking the assets and capabilities the company has and recombobulating it into something new. And he has, he wants to roll this out. He basically rolls it out internally and tries to get, it's a very product led, product out type of vision, tries to get a lot of people uh, behind it internally. And there's some traction, but he keeps going forward it slips, then it doesn't, then nothing happens, then he goes again. And what was interesting, we, we kind of followed him around, not exactly in the same way Bryce followed uh, Alan around, but we, we saw him do this a few times. What was interesting was he was so enthusiastic about his idea of what this new product would be and how it would change the world and everything else. He would, he would change the way he talked about it to, to, to kind of capture interest each time. And mm -hmm. the culture he was dealing with was so literal. They were like, well, he keeps changing his mind. And if you actually listen, yeah, he's using different words. He's using different metaphors. He's using different analogies. But he is talking about the same thing each time. You just are so literal, you don't get it. So I think this idea of kind of message discipline, what that, that's, that was what originally Bryce and I connected over was it, this, you just got to keep saying it and saying it and saying it and being really nauseatingly exhausting about, about saying this thing and then getting people to kind of see themselves in that picture. You got to do it in a way that's super repetitive, but interesting enough at the same time. That's why it's, it's much more of an art form than a science, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Well, Let's take a short break. When we come back, Gavin, I would like to pick up on this theme of message discipline because it's something that you and I, I first clicked on. And I also want to talk to you about something else that, that I've learned from you, which is, is about how people learn. So um, stay tuned. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. 
Welcome back. So, Gavin, we were talking about message discipline. Yep. And this is such an important concept because one of the things that we talk about uh, at Red Team Thinking is the three C's, soon to be four C's, I think. But the first C is clarity and message discipline is is so essential to clarity. Before we get into message discipline, though, yeah. or as kind of a foundation for message discipline, one of the first conversations you and I ever had that that really has just stuck with me for years is about radio discipline oh, in yeah. World War One and how that factors into message discipline. Can you talk to people about that? It's a fascinating concept. Yeah, so I, this is probably not a true story, but it's something <laughs> something my it's mother told me. <laughs> yeah, something my mother told me. Uh, the, so you, you'll know this, Marcus, when you get into the army or the military, you, you they basically teach you radio discipline. So you have all, all sorts of people from all sorts of different walks of life with different accents, and that it's really important that the whatever you're saying has to be clear and understandable. I remember it well. So the, the story my mother told me is that supposedly in the First World War in the trenches, some uh, some regiment sent a runner, sent a message back to regimental headquarters. And by the time it went, you know, the telephone wires were broken. So they sent runners and they sent... They hand-delivered messages. I don't even know they use pigeons. But the message was, send reinforcements. We're going to advance. And according to my mother, so again, veracity of the source is not necessarily great. Um, the actual message that got to regimental headquarters was, send three and four pence. We're going to a dance. And that was the, <laughs> that was the story the I told. Um, right. Yeah. But well, well, but the, but also the concept that you shared with me that comes from this, which I know is true, because I, I, I after you shared it with me, I, I read up on this, is that the reason that we get that, that militaries, at least in 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 the West, yeah. in the in English speaking world, came up with these very fixed terms for acknowledging messages for yeah. how you say things came from the fact that just what you said, that we were dealing with people from different educational backgrounds, different accents, different regions, different countries fighting together. Yeah. And the opportunities for confusion in communications were rife. And so the way that you cut through that was by having this very standardized parlance. Yeah. Exactly. That dictated, you know, so every pilot is not up, you know, saying, you know, their own little take on, you know, I'm engaging three targets at, at this, at this, at these coordinates. You know, it's 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 very fixed, and that allows much of the confusion to be to be prevented. And and the reason I think this is so relevant to to business and to what we talk about today is because people forget about the ways that that their ambiguous words can create confusion in the workplace with their teams and things like that. And this gets into Rose's book, the chocolate conversation yeah. yes. about why it's so important to be clear about what terms mean. Yeah, exactly. And also it allows people, the, doesn't it? People interpret it as they wish. If it's ambiguous, even if they know what your intent yeah. is and they don't want to do that, they'll use it and go, but I thought you meant, so I took everybody this way and they go, Oh, well, yeah, exactly. and then it's back on you for not being clear. I could do what I want. It's funny because you can you can you can tell what people's prior career was when they sound out a name, and if they use the NATO phonetic alphabet, you <laughs> you kind of know what they they used to do. So it's Mike, Oscar, Papa, or is it Mary, Oswald? Yeah. You know, <laughs> Penguin. <laughs> um, yeah. So definitely true about that, and I I think I think it gets back to again it gets back to these. You know, how do we translate strategy through an organization? And the, the chocolate conversation is a is an example of that. So just to recap that, that's the, the chocolate conversation is the idea that we're all talking about the same thing, but we all leave the room with very different understandings of what we all talked about, what we all mean. And I, I like to think, I, I like to say, I, and I think it's true that, you know, companies, for most companies, your vision, mission, strategy, and goals are just this kind of synonymous mess because you use the same words to talk about, you know, that's my vision. Okay, so what's your mission? Uh, oh, well, it's the, it's the same thing. And it gets so confusing. 
And you've got, you've also oh. got this granularity problem. It's like a Goldilocks problem, right? How where do, how granular do you need to be at each level? Is it just mm -hmm. too big? Or, that's too big. That's too little. This is just right. It, it's it's a massively consuming, pro uh, difficult problem. And then you've got, like you said, Marcus, you've got people just choosing to do what they did. I, I want to go all the way back to inertia when you said about engagement and and all of that. I I think, especially in the new world of work, especially when we've got work that's we've acknowledged now that it's much more distributed than it it was distributed before we just now know because people are in cyprus or in in the uk we we've got to get a lot clearer about how we do things and a lot and a lot clearer around the messaging and a lot rose to quote rose again rose likes to say message discipline drives operational discipline and i think that's completely true Very if you can get so. that right you can drive operational discipline in your organization because that goes back to clarity doesn't it bryce Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. This is why clarity is so important. Yeah. And, you know, we've all seen so many times, I know you have too, Gavin, where you come into an organization and you, and, and they, they're so excited about this great plan, this great strategy, this great initiative that they're doing. And you, and you ask half a dozen people, what, why are, why are you doing this? What's the point of this? And you get yeah. half a dozen different answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and if you, if people, if the leadership doesn't understand what hope is there for, for the for the people on the front lines to understand? And all of that confusion, all of that lack of clarity gets cascaded down as well. And, you know, it's 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 so important and it's so important to be focused. It's so important to be clear <clears throat> and it's so important to to tell people things in a way that they can they can understand that. And, you know, I love what you said about granularity, because I'll go back to to Alan's four point program. You know, at, at four, Alan keeps him with his message. You know, 2007, Ford starts to turn around. By the beginning of 2008, they're almost profitable again after having been almost bankrupt. And then the global financial crisis happens and and it's kind of all bets are off. And and everyone comes to Alan on the senior leadership team and says, great, what's the new, what's the new plan? What's the new plan to deal with this global <clears throat> financial crisis now? That, and Alan says, build cars and trucks people want in value. I don't know what just happened there, but I you got a thumbs up for that. Did you guys see totally that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow! Yeah. The, the AI, they, they, the they AI supported agrees. what you were saying. <laughs> so, build cars and trucks that people want and value. Restructure the uh, structure the company to meet the changing demand and model mix. Work together effectively as one team and finance the plan. Yeah, he said, "What has changed?" And everyone's like, well, the global auto industry is collapsing. Right. So yeah. we have to adjust production. We have to be profitable with the current demand and changing model mix. What else has changed? The the credit markets have, have swung close. Well, we have to deal with the balance sheet as it is. And, and his whole point was nothing has changed. The strategy remains the same. Yeah. What you do to yeah. achieve those four points has, has become radically different, but it's still the same plan. This goes and back people to why, just like a how, like, doesn't it? Right. Why, what, how? We all know it. Well, we, hopefully we know why we're doing this and we know what we need to do, the four things, but the how you do those are down to the front line, to the operators with the best information, best knowledge, the empowerment to do it, because then yeah. they will flex and fluctuate those requirements to achieve the what by adapting the how. It's when you mandate the how that you start to get the problem because it's too rigid at that point. That's what we talked about yeah, earlier, wasn't it? Right. You've got to give people that flexibility, as you mentioned, Gavin. Yeah, and the why and the what is seeing yourself in the picture, because then you can yeah. figure out how. I'll tell you, you know, you talked about um, this confusion in language. There's, there's two ways. Well, he, here's something that I think is a – this because a, one of the things that's great about red teaming is all the all – the, tools and techniques that you do things. And this isn't a red teaming tool, but it's something that we've done that I think is really instructive, especially for senior teams that are rolling out strategies or are trying to drive some kind of change in the organization. We'll typically ask, um, well, it, it, let's, let's use the word purpose. What is the purpose of X, where X is your business? Or it could be mission, it could be strategy, it doesn't matter really what it is. 
And you ask different people. You ask the head of IT. You ask the head of HR. You ask the sales leaders, the whoever else. And then we've often done this where you you can map that on a on a on a grid, where one the the kind of up down axis, the the y axis is something like higher order strategic, and the lower order is tactical, and then. When you go left and right, when you go on the x-axis, it's uh, inward-facing and outward-facing. And what's funny is you see you see these blobs appear of everyone's kind of talking about the same thing when they talk about their purpose and their mission, but the the the, the blobs kind of get very distributed depending how they talk about it. And it's very when you show that back to a senior team, it's it's very oh I. I didn't even realize that we're we're doing this, and I'll bring up AI because it's 2023, so I have to. Um, have to. It's compulsory. One of the things, that, yeah, one of the things that generative AI is really good at is that kind of semantic analysis when you can kind of take in a lot of because bef- in the old days when we used to do that, we had to do a lot of thinking about well, is that a higher order thing or a lower order thing? You can yeah. you can load all that stuff into. Claude or ChatGPT and spit out answers. And you can do it actually with not just across 10 people on a senior team. You can do it across a whole organization and see, well, what is it you really, where are you really focused? What do you really think when you map out how people think about language? Well, you know, this is so interesting because this gets into something else that I, that I learned from you. Probably the most important thing I've learned from you, Gavin, Mm. um, is how people learn and the fact that not everybody learns the same. And, and the way this, I don't know if you'll remember this, but we were having breakfast at, uh, it, it wasn't the Ridge yet. It was before Verizon uh, redid their, their uh, hotel and restaurant. I don't remember what it was called before it was the Ridge. Um, but we were having breakfast at, at Verizon's headquarters yeah. in New Jersey. And you told me, you know, you you really need to rethink your your the way you do speeches, and I was like, I was really kind of dumbfounded because I got all this great feedback from you know I was doing a lot of speaking at that point on my first book, American Icon, and I was like, people are happy with my speeches. What's what do I need to change? And and at this point, I just my the way I gave presentations, I'd walk into a room and I I stand up in front of a microphone and I tell tell stories like this, and you said uh, people learn in different ways. There, there, there's audio, audio, oral learners who learn through through hearing yeah. audio. There's tactile learners who learn from doing things, and there's visual learners who 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 learn from seeing things. And you're not using a, a slide deck with your presentation. You're missing the third of the people in the in the room who are visual learners. And by not doing activities, you're missing the people who are who are tactile learners who need to experience things. And and this was like mind blowing to me. Like I like I was like skeptical about this. I went home and I like I, I googled you know different learning styles and stuff. And I was like, my gosh, this Gavin guy knows what he's talking about. Can you talk a little bit about that and about you know you are you are the biggest PowerPoint guru I have ever met in the world. <laughs> PowerPoint is off derided, but you you have made a virtue out of it. Can you talk a little bit about different learning styles and and how to use PowerPoint effectively yeah. to convey messages? Yeah, absolutely. Well, two things. First thing is, I was absolutely terrified when you said you you know something about learning, and I was like, I. I can't remember what he's talking about, <laughs> which is a really bad answer when you said, when you, this person knows a lot about learning. That's not a good answer, but thank you for reminding me. <clears throat> Second thing is, and I have to say this because there'll be some people that listen to this podcast, the whole, the theory of learning styles has pretty much been debunked. It's, oh, it's, okay. um, but it, it feels intuitively true, which, which is probably why it landed and, and stuck with you. It, it definitely feels true. I would I would go to a, a slightly different way of thinking about it, which is if you think about the way our brains process information and, and the and the capacity we have in our brains, we've got a lot dedicated to uh, how we hear all the different senses: hearing, touch, smell. But the the biggest cognitive load, the biggest kind of energy chewer in our brains, is the visual one. So why wouldn't you occupy as much 
brain power in your audience as possible because it's much more likely to to get whatever you're saying to land. And then on top of that, this is where storytelling comes in. If you actually use vivid language, stories, everything else, it's not just the processing centers of your brain that that interpret visuals, that interpret what you're hearing and the, and the kind of executive function, but you're also the the kind of emotional part of your brain, and I forget the word for it, but neuroscientists and psychologists will know, that's working too. So you're basically, your job is when you're, doing what Bryce was doing, which is going up in front of a, a stage and you, you're trying to light up as many brains as much as possible. So how do I kind of make that a like simple thing for simple people like me to understand? I think about three things, words, structure, and pictures. And you can tell I like movies because I'll go back to movies. People are really good at messaging, people who make adverts, people that write books like uh, Bryce novelists, uh, filmmakers, documentarians, when they get really, really good, they get really, really specialized to the point that there's an Oscar for uh, special effects. There's an Oscar for acting. There's an Oscar for screenplay. There's got these real specializations. When you, let, let's kind of break those uh, let's kind of bubble those specializations up a bit. They basically are a bunch of specializations about words and language, a bunch of specializations around pictures, the visuals that we create in our head and the ones that you actually see. So that could be set design, that could be, you know, special effects, uh, costume design, those types of things. And then there's a, there's a there's specialization around structure. So the organization of the information, the screenplay, the three act play, those kind of things. So what, what I, I, I just apply that to PowerPoint. Why wouldn't you sync up word structure and pictures, what you're saying, the things that people are seeing and the organization of the information to make it as easy as possible for people to understand and to light up as many brain cells as you can when you're doing it. It just, it just seems to make sense. And what we've discovered since then, and we've done this with a lot of people is that People typically, if you, if you think about word structure pictures as the, as the building blocks of any messaging, people typically have an affinity for a couple of those things. As a presenter, as a CEO, you know, if you're working on your executive presence. So you, you'll have people that are pretty good at words and structure, but they're not very good at pictures, which basically means they're boring because they're not engaging or entertaining people at all. You have people that are pretty good at words and pretty good at pictures, which means they're really entertaining and people love listening to them, but they have a hard time figuring out where they're going because there is no structure, there is no path. And then you also have, I think, the vast majority of us who are pretty good at pictures, like how to engage and, and connect with people connect ideas, pretty good at structure, but words, terrible. So these are all the people that fill in the form about what's my biggest fear, public speaking number one, clowns number two, snakes number three. That's that's those people. And I'm one of them. I, I And I think if your words last, you're very aware that you have a, a weakness in how do I present, how do I get my message across, and you're just waiting for the words to collide in your head and make no sense. And then you're like, okay, I'm done talking now or I'm talking around in circles. So yeah, that was the, that was the conversation. And I apologize for, you know, having to go at the way you presented. I didn't know it, but it, it, <laughs> it was transformational for me because after that, I, I, I worked with you and your team and developed a slide deck mm. and I understand, and I, and I learned through that process of working with you in your team, how to develop a slide deck? What are some of the, what are the best practices? What are the rules? What, you know, why do you do this and not that? You know, why do you structure a slide this way and not that? And, and Marcus will tell you to, to, to a fault, perhaps, I still obsess about this stuff. And it I, has- I'm sorry, Marcus. <laughs> blame, Mark, okay. Gavin is the one to blame for all that, Marcus. I know what you're but, it's, but it's true. It's yeah. true and I, I, it transformed 
me from being a good speaker to a great speaker. I remember yeah. the very first presentation I did after after working with you was was still one of the biggest speeches I ever gave. It was it was to uh, to what the biggest uh, Catholic healthcare group company in the United in North America. Right. And talk about a tough audience. There was there was thousands of people in the audience. Over over two thirds of them were nuns. But they were nuns who were engaged in running multi billion dollar businesses, right? And uh, cool, and, nuns. and and, and it's, a niche, it's a niche group. <laughs> it's a niche group. But I got up and, and and I and I'm thinking I'm I'm channeling Gavin here, and I'm thinking you know the the biggest barrier, the first thing that you know I'm here I'm going to tell these nuns a story about Ford Motor Company and leadership. Yeah. And so the first barrier I'm going to I need to overcome. Is is to is to the fact that a I'm I'm not a nun, and b I'm I'm not talking about anything remotely religious or or in their in in what I perceive to be their ken and and the first slide I I, I put up was a a picture of the Pope getting into a brand new Ford, <laughs> and I mean the whole place just erupted in laughter. Right, right. And, and, and the point was, is is with an image, without any words coming out of my mouth, yeah, I, I that barrier just collapsed, yeah. and then we were able to go in and, you know, and uh, um, there's a definite art. And, and I said, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that's what I learned, and I and I learned from you, Gavin, that there's this dance between what you're saying and what you're showing, yeah, and the structure that ties it together, and that's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I I think. Um, you know, PowerPoint gets a bad net, bad name and a bad rap. And we, we, for better or for worse, PowerPoint, you know, if we, we've been talking about language and we've been talking about communication and translation. But when it, when it comes to most organizations, and there are a few notable exceptions, PowerPoint is the dialect that everyone speaks to each other. Mm-hmm. And they just don't do it very well. Right. And if you think about right. Think about, again, think about the connection between red teaming, leadership, storytelling. It's all about how do I make better decisions and how do I amplify those decisions? And any business anywhere, I think, is is really simple. It, they're all the same. They all sell stuff. How I sell and what the stuff is and maybe how I build it and all the rest is, is that's where the variation comes in. That's where McKinsey and Bain start to make their money. Right. But, but they're all doing the same thing. And ultimately the value that that organization creates, the value that business creates in selling stuff is, is due to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of decisions being made, big decisions, little decisions, daily, weekly, whatever they are. And if we can't get better at talking to each other, communicating mm-hmm. with each other, if we can't be- get better at the discipline of making the decisions and making sure we're take, you know, left is definitely not off the table. Maybe send, maybe straight ahead and right are pretty good. Then you can just create more value. But I think most people, it's a philosophical argument that most people don't necessarily connect because it's just easier to do what you you did yesterday. Boom. On that bombshell, Gavin. Couldn't have said it better ourselves. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. We have to have you on again. There's so much we didn't even get into. We didn't, for instance, yeah. talk about you getting your nose broken by the French Foreign Legion. <laughs> um, all sorts of cool stuff. I've told you too many stories, pleasure. I think. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing storytelling. Exactly. Love it. Thank you. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome, Gavin. Pleasure to meet you, sir.